A very good morning, dear colleagues. It's the fourth time we're doing Finnopolis Forum, and for all those four years, I've been dreaming that one of the plenary discussions is dedicated not just to the future and further discussions, but the actual discussion of the existing current projects. The topic of this session is FinTech as a platform and solutions. So we would like to talk about real solutions, what is being done right now. And also with our colleagues, we will discuss further plans for the infrastructure projects that are being done together with the market participants or by the market participants on their own, but they would like to see the support of the regulator. My first question is focused on the launch of remote identification, a biometrical platform that we're developing together with the market participants and we've launched it this year and since June, this system has become operational. It was indeed a long and complicated journey for creation of this platform. As you probably remember, for several years we've been saying that we need a single biometrical infrastructure so that we have an opportunity to offer remote services. And there were different discussions uh, varying from the idea of creating several platforms, a one platform, advantages and disadvantages. And finally we came to a conclusion that since we would like to have an infrastructure offering equal access for all participants and we would like to secure all the data, including biometrical data for our customers and users, we're creating national infrastructure that from the outset would be secured according to all the top standards. It has to be flexible in tuning it has to be able to develop quickly and easily. However, all market participants need to be clearly aware of those development plans. And as a final outcome, together with the Ministry of Communication and Ross Telecom, we've created such a platform. My first colleague goes to the colleagues representing banks, Dmitry Oleg and others. You started operating on this platform. What is your first feedback? What do you think was done efficiently and what do you think should be further enhanced where we should tackle those issues jointly? And one more question. How do you think? Should all market participants be connected to this platform or not? Vladimir, let's start with you. Thank you very much for the question, Olga. I do believe in such solutions as a single biometrical system. I don't know whether there are such models somewhere in the world apart from Russia. First of all, it's good for competition development, it's good for customer, it enables us to overcome certain logistical barriers and regulatory barriers. Just the day before yesterday, we launched a full-fledged function when any user that is registered at this platform will be able to remotely open banking cards at Alpha Bank and do all the operations. So far, the scope of such customers is just starting to grow. Talking of the reasons why it is just a beginning so far, well, I think it is very important that all banks are either connected or should have an opportunity to get connected to this platform. And once we get this critical mass in place and as the snowball starts rolling, we could create a system that is much more attractive for the user. So it's a problem of a chicken and an egg. What was first? If people do not register there, they do not use those biometrical services of the bank. Once they're registered, they start using them. The more banks we have at the platform, the better. And of course, Alpha Bank and other private banks are most interested in providing access to this platform for our customers and customers of our colleagues. Thank you. Oleg, what would you say? Well, historically, since we've been gathering biometrical data online, uh, we got connected to the system. We are quite satisfied with the preliminary results. We interact on operational issues with the Central Bank of Russia and other experts. And so far, we do not encounter any major issues. However, I would say that that is clearly the future. The future is in use of biometrical identification. No other identificators can stand the comparison with biometrical identificator. That would definitely be very helpful for um, uh, combating fraud. and make identification process very efficient, certainly. No other type of passwords or codes or code words would 
gave you such an opportunity and such a level of understanding whether the actual user is the person that is allowed to have access to this data. As for ways to get connected to the platform, definitely all the banks should be connected to that. Uh, Russian and global practice demonstrate as soon as there are certain restrictions introduced or some um, membership issues, the system fails to work. It is important to create an ecosystem that is open for everybody. If it is not open for everybody, then it will not work. I don't know whether it should be done on a, a regulatory basis or from the viewpoint of legislation, but all financial institutions need to gather this information and have access to this platform. I've also noticed, and I'd recommend it to all colleagues who haven't visited the uh, both of operation of this biometrical system here at Finopolis, where different banks demonstrate how they interact with the system. And I've noted that since banks dif have different internal processes, they uh, do you further processing of information differently? The biometrical identifies used very quickly. It takes just three to five seconds to do that if it is remote identification. And further on, on the side of the bank, there is a process connected with internal processing of the bank. In some banks, it goes very quickly. In some banks, it takes longer. So the processes that are being by the banks on their side, do you think they should reconsider those processes due to introduction of biometrical identifier? The customer is interested in the total time required to get identified and locked in. Do you plan to introduce respective changes to your internal processing once you connect to the system? Well, I'm happy to say that biometrical identification is uh, paper-free process. So in our bank, we are going to develop a paperless technologies everywhere, call center, mobile bank, our or physical office, uh, a user can do any operation without physical signature, without any papers, just using biometrical identification. And you're right in saying that is just the, the tip of the iceberg, uh, the biometrical identification, it's done by the regulator. As for the rest of the iceberg, out of the water, all that is in interior processes, internal processes of the bank that, that make customer experience very positive. Dmitry, over to you. You were one of the first banks that designed and launched the system. Yes, here you are. I know at the beginning of the journey, there were very many open questions, not just on the side of our infrastructure partners, but also on the side of your bank. What kind of difficulties have you faced? It is important for us to understand that so that we consider those issues in the future and resolve them together in order to launch other projects in a much more smooth way, primarily for the members of the system and as a result for the customers, of course. What is your vision of the further development of the system? Thank you for the question. Well, you ask the bankers. I would also answer this question, if I may, whether everybody should be connected to the system. My answer is no, but I believe that all the banks should have an opportunity to get connected because there might be banks that for some reasons do not have trust for this technology and let them make their choices. As for our, us, we were the first ones to join this development and I would say about one third of all templates were gathered by us and that's just the beginning. Definitely we will speed up in the future. As for implementation, well, it doesn't make any sense to discuss technological issues now, but if we talk about uh, state standards, probably uh, the problem was that it is not very compatible with real life. Our post bank has been operating with biometrical data from the outset on proprietary algorithm, and once we were collecting those templates and data, we had to change some things because the decision made by the regulator was different. Well, that's probably proper, but next time if you do something, it would be good to take a look at the key players of the market and maybe not to reinvent the wheel and build it from scratch, but use the best practices. In order to make the project fly and skyrocket, it, I would cite a simple example. Of course, we'll get connected. We will mm, scale it further. Alpha Bank got connected two days ago, and we demonstrated it yesterday together with Ross Telecom how it operates on a mobile app, how you can select any product at our mobile app by identifying yourself using a simple template. So that's the reality of today. But in order to make the project fly, uh, we can introduce an, an account. 
a log. So again, the same question, who would uh, give out passwords? I can tell you that um, our SIA account was confirmed by 1 million users at Postbank. They came to us in order to get this account for free, of course. And I think it would take very little time to get 1 million customers to pass their biometrical data. Obviously, geography of the country of Russia requires those remote identification. We're the biggest country in the globe. We have to have these remote services very efficient. And it is important that this template in the service goes beyond the borders of the industry. We launched this story because the banks are most advanced in Russia. We discussed that from time to time, and indeed, from the viewpoint of the level of technology development in the industry, I would say Russia is most advanced in this area, particularly in the banking sector. However, if we further scale it to other services, governmental services and non-governmental services, I'm very certain that this template would get millions of users. One more question to you. We are continuing our discussion whether identification by voice and face is sufficient. That's what we're using. Or we have to add something more, for example, a photo of your purely or a fingerprint. You worked with the, the system. How do you think where, whether we need it or not? Because, of course, both face and voice recognition provide very high level of um, identification. Well, I think it makes sense to add extra levels when there is a threat for this um, template to be destroyed and any extra level in your system would cost a lot. I guess each one of you have a camera built into your phone or a laptop and a microphone. Do many of you have a fingerprint scanner at your phone or a computer? Obviously it is there but it's not proper for identification of financial transactions. Of course we can add up new technologies but if there is no clear threat so far maybe and there is no need to do that. So if we do recognize the threat from the side of hackers or maybe the technology is way too complicated and it requires a lot of resources, we would search for alternatives. So I would only support step-by-step -step development and evolutionary development. Ilya, over to you. You are also a member of the group that uh, were the very first to test this system and you've done that successfully. What would you say from the viewpoint of further development of this platform? Thank you for the question, Olga. The first thing I'd like to say is that it actually works. And we, just similar like other banks, are actively engaged in this process. and. A lot of Russian citizens are passing their biometrical data and that is a very positive process. I would also say that now it is becoming a competitive advantage for banks. I encounter a lot of customers who ask, do your officers accept biometrical data in this particular city or not? And that is uh, one of the key factors defining the choice of a bank or a customer and that would be a competitive advantage very soon. I also would like to say that it supports the banks in becoming more digital and going faster. Now, each pro product that we plan to develop, we develop it through the prism of biometrical data. And next year, we plan to launch more and more products that would be accessible uh, with remote identification. So it makes our banks better and um, more flexible in terms of digital developments. Talking of problems that we should work on together, it is important to say that still our citizens have uh, some concerns regarding the issues of security. So it is very important to promote this issue and that can be done together by the banks, by the central bank, by the Ministry of uh, Communications. And next year, there would be more and more banks joining the project, more and more offices of the banks would be accepting remote identification. So I think we have to use this momentum to popularize and promote this issue, and that would make the project fly and would definitely support banks in their developments. How do you think? Should all the banks be connected to the system or not? Again. Of course, the customer is to choose. The customer is to grant their consent, whether they would like to use remote biometrical identification or not. But from the viewpoint of the banks as participants of the system, if it's just part of them getting connected, it would mean that some of the data would simply be not there in the system. And then they will 
it would be very hard for other banks to render those services that are not connected. So if we're saying that infrastructure has to operate and be available for all participants of the system while the customer would decide for themselves whether they will use it or not. What is your position, whether banks have to be connected or not, whether it should be mandatory or not? Well, as you said, for sure, it should be a free choice of each customer. Talking of the banks, I would say it has to be mandatory for every bank and that would create uh, equal pr playground from the viewpoint of competition and that would make the system efficient and would uh, make it fly. So my answer is yes, it should be mandatory for all banks to join the system. Dimitri, over to you. You touched on the issue of ISIA and further connection of uh, biometrical platform. The question is to create the right infrastructure whenever you launch big complicated solutions. We've been thinking long what's the right way to create a biometrical platform and we decided we need to connect it to other platforms because there are many uh, track records of our residents, around 80 million of them, and by a adding biometrical templates we expand the systems of the systems. What else has to be resolved for remote services is the issue of signature. Because at the moment even digital signature is very complicated from the viewpoint of use by individuals. So, do you think we should work further on offering digital uh, signature or signature by means of your fingerprint or biometrical data? I think that is also part of the upcoming future, so that in one package you provide your custom with the maximum number of services with simple but reliable means of identification. Well, digital signature is already there, it works in our country, it is still a future for some, but it is almost a past for us. All products could be signed by digital signatures of our local, our own, the project that we support. If it would become a standard for everybody, I would only welcome that. And I do not see any tragedy in how we're going to combine the system of digital signature and electronic templates. As far as I understand, it all should bring us to single signature format and would enable a person to do any type of operations in any systems that would support this template. But I still believe we can not force the banks into joining those systems. Uh, for some banks, it might be way too difficult from the economical viewpoint. All right, thank you. Oleg, you seem to be bored. You know everything about biometrical data. Tinkoff has been working on that for a very long time and getting connected to a uh, single biometrical system is no news for you. So, the key thing I'd like to hear from you on biometrical data, and we of course see that the system is working, it is set to develop further. This platform has to go hand in hand with the market participants and consumers, and we've allocated a year and a half for a system to become fully operational by the end of 2019, proceeding from the open issues defined by my colleagues. Coming back to the issue of infrastructure solutions, I'd like to ask Oleg um, to discuss with us our second project. And yesterday, Oleg said that he's not quite clear whether he's for it or against it, but later he actually supported us, which makes us very optimistic, but at the same time from the viewpoint of opportunities. The platform of fast payments. What would it give to you as a bank? Or it would give you nothing. If you had your doubts, would you please share with us the cons and pros that you considered? Well, I cannot speak for all of other banks, but our bank uh, is only worried about the economical aspects, because in our bank we don't have any politics in place. There is no place for politics, there is no place for irrational thinking. I'm proud to say that we are very American in this regard. We only talk money. We want to take a look at the tariffs. We want to understand what the tariffs would be and if those tariffs are better, cheaper than the existing tariffs, then and the final outcome it would be cheaper for a consumer and it would work, then we would support it. We're ready to support anything that would make end customer, our end client of Tinkoff Bank, better services at a better price. It's all very simple. So our only concern is what the tariffs would be, who would manage the whole system. Because this association was organized for a reason and at the beginning it was set up 
by one of the commercial players of the market. So I'd like to remind you, and there were many questions regarding this decision. Uh, we were not quite clear how come one of the market players ends up being a uh, founder of association where other commercial banks are mandatory to be connected. What is the role of this commercial player? What is the commercial interest of this particular player? So those are the questions that we were worried by. Now we're probably less worried by that and we have um, uh, less concerns. But we are politics free. We are for money. If it's cheap and technologically efficient, fine, let's do it. Uh. Well, at its origin, of course, there were several participants that launched the association. No one was in charge, so to say. It was in dialogue with several commercial banks that we started to create it. The tariff specifically, the commissions, should they be at zero within the platform and then the participating bank will formulate their client policy? Yeah, we want zero. And, that, and then we, we would like to decide for ourselves. That would be the perfect, the perfect solution. This is pretty much what I expected from you. Yes, we believe that the state has to take the infrastructural costs. The state builds the roads and investors build businesses alongside that road. So I think you should build it and then make it available to us for free. So this is an American company speaking, of course. Yeah, but we will be paying about 15 billion rubles in taxes this year. But you understand that in any infrastructural project bears some costs and they will have to be compensated at some point. Well, Bank of Russia is a state agency, so I believe that, that it's up to the state to finance that. I, I don't understand why do we need to subsidize that. But from this point of view, it also means that you subsidize card transactions because interchange is for pay for the banks, isn't it? Yes, but when we discuss infrastructural solutions, then I believe there must be costs. It could come up to zero once the system has paid for itself, but I believe it is important to offer minimal commissions to ensure that this it fits well into your operational model, that you can build your services on top of the platform. This I agree with. I also fear that if we set the commissions at a very low rate, then they can still be expensive to the end customer. So we want to make sure that the banks don't overcharge in their commissions with the customer, given that they pay very little to the operator. Volodya, perhaps you. Well, Adam Smith has taught us that the competition will, will drive us to bring tariffs to the minimum level. At the same time, I disagree with Oleg. As any such infrastructural solution, I believe that uh, this system should receive some financing because this is for our development, this is uh, for everyone. So the minimal payment of some kind, I think, is, is would be a good, good decision. Also, it must be transparent because it is a monopoly, of course, so at any point they may start charging as much as I, as I want. Therefore, transparency, long-term vision and minimal costs. Ilya, what do you think about pricing when we will be launching this system? So it is about commissions and tariffs. November is the time for the first pilot. In January, the system must be operational. And from the technical point of view, we can see that this is all feasible. 
So 12 banks will start operating the system from November and uh, it's only about the tariffs and commissions. Well, I agree that it cannot be at zero, that it has to compensate for the funds that it has consumed, but I think they should be very low and they should compare favorably with the dominant system on the market, the P2P payments. So if you start off minimal, I think this should be this should be the right thing to do in terms of pricing. What would the fair tariff be? It's also up to you, perhaps you would share. In terms of competition on the market that what we discussed at the first session yesterday, it's not about making money for the banks in terms of uh, these commissions because customers are already used to having very low next to zero tariffs for P2P transactions. Therefore, in order to remain compatible, competitive, we will of course have to be operating with very low tariffs. My next question is to Nikolai Stavronsky, founder and CEO of uh, Revolut. You've skyrocketed as a platform in several locations worldwide as a P2P solution, which is cheaper on your platform and which is faster than your ch platform. And this has allowed you to grow from zero to a very substantial size. Nikolai, how is it working in the UK? since you started there. Now you're applying to start operations in Russia as well. And what is the niche that you see for your business on the Russian market? And do you see any potential partners? And do you see a competitive advantage on the Russian market? Because my colleagues were right in saying that the Russian market, from the point of view of fintech, is very advanced already. But you seem to believe that there is a niche, that there is field for development for you as a business on the Russian market. So what is this field? What do you define as this potential? If I may, a few words about Revolut. We launched three years ago in the UK. It was to start with a bank account and a bank card that gave you interbank exchange rates and uh, and this allowed our customers to save about 30 to 40 US dollars per $1,000 spent. Now we've added other products. Uh, there are loans, there's insurers, there's cryptocurrency trading, there are business accounts available to our customers. We have a trading sub-platform investment tools. Now we have 30 million customers and uh, we open about 10,000 accounts a day all over Europe, 28 countries in Europe. Now we're launching in the United States, Australia, Singapore, India, New Zealand. And the question was about how could we help Russia? I think there's a pricing issue in Russia in terms of transactions. If you give us the license then there will be no cost in terms of uh, P2P transactions. No worries if Revolut wants to come and do it for free for the Russian customer. Absolutely. Oleg, this is what you dreamt of. Revolut could just as well not start their operations in Russia because we, we launched our 30 currency card yesterday and we offered it to the market for free. We are a financial startup and an inspiration to many Russian banks and we learned from Revolut internationally we realized that this is what you need so our card has the bat has the shekel and all the exotic so to say currencies and we re released that uh, launched that yesterday and now you can just have a tink of black card with 30 Currencies linked to that with uh, the interbank exchange rate, so you might just as well stop with with your expansion. It's very interesting to see how innovation works in Russia. You launched now what we launched three years ago. Well done. You know what the next thing we're going to be doing? It's commission-free trading. So you follow in three years. This is not the most necessary 
thing in Russia. Cryptocurrency, we're not going to be doing that. We know that the Central Bank of Russia won't allow that. We know that you're making most of your money from cryptocurrency exchange. It's actually an interesting question and I think this is the most important thing that I'm going to say this morning so you might just as well take note. I think the problem with the global fintech companies is that they exist on the commission difference and they also use the difference in regulatory frameworks in different countries. So Revolut has become anxious already with Revolut operations in, in the UK. So I think that uh, fintech companies, they are there to teach us innovation and technology. We want to learn from fintech companies, we want to acquire them, we want to emulate them, yes, because they bring innovation in terms of biometrics, in terms of AI. This is added value to me. But just operate without commission. I don't. I don't think there's much rocket science in that. For someone who graduated from uh, Moscow F Phys Tech and University, I don't think this is something that smart. Um, new technology, biometrics, artificial intelligence, huge field for smart people to create new fast technology. We will be ready to use but get rid of commission and then raise uh, investment and you can be you know three two three billion this won't work in russia there is there are no investors as as you might, might have in brazil for instance where new bank is now worth four billion here you can you cannot really do that S start on the market be commission free and do raising with investors on and on. This can work in uh, the United States, or maybe elsewhere with pre-IPO, IPO, public offers and so on. Therefore, I'm, I'm very concerned about international fintech companies because for the most part they don't add anything novel, but they, they abuse the differences between different legislations. It's easy to have three million accounts when you don't have basic QAC. Of course you're going to have cheaper transactions. I would want to do that as well. So shall we apply for that uh, with the Bank of Russia? I don't think this amounts to a competitive advantage at all. I will actually support Oleg in this one. Alpha Bank, at Alpha Bank we like, we love fintech companies, now we launched our own investment fund and we look at it as, as inspiration. We think that specific fintech, individual fintech companies, they survive uh, at the rate 1 to 1,000, 10,000 companies. So I don't think they're going to break the bank markets. We, it cannot really alter the landscape. Something similar is happening in, in Poland, maybe in Asia. And in Russia we have strong regulatory framework, so these arbitrary developments, I don't think they're possible in this country. So you see, Nikolai, a lot of challenges to enter the Russian market. It's going to be very easy, actually, because if you enter as an underdog. So, two questions to you, Nikolai. So, QAC procedures to start with, you have a plan for that? We shall follow the law. You'll have to learn the words like Federal Law 115, you know, if you get the license. Some new tricks for you to learn. I hope everybody wants to be more efficient. Therefore, non-face-to-face QAC, I think, is the future for everyone. And it's great to see this this coming up in Russia. This is what we're going to use next year. Uh, but what was the re rep your reply, if, if I may? You're going to be compliant? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. 
we actually work on the same side with the regulator here because the regulator wants there to be competition and everything to be legal. This is what we're going to do. Is there any choice? Were there any choice? In theory, yes, there is choice, but but if you want to st start operations on a new market, there are rules, and we believe that the set the same set of rules must apply to everyone. No doubt about that. And the second question Oleg has uh, already touched upon. Yes, what we see in terms of payments, the, the fintech startups, they do prim this primitive uh, operations and because of commission difference, they, uh, they make money short term and they seem to be successful. What you have is, is uh, payments and uh, good currency exchange rates. Uh, it's more than 30 currencies as far as I understand. Anything else? Because you can't uh, survive that long with, with just those two advantages. Well, we started with that three years ago. Now our best advantage is automation. We only have uh, 600 employees uh, servicing 3 million people. Metrobank or Tinkoff, you have 3 to 5 million customers with 10 to 20,000 employees. So we several times more efficient, and that's why our prices can be 10 to 20 times lower and this is what the banks are afraid of uh, because we're so automated we don't need to hire all those management managers operational managers compliance managers and so on this is tech the tech component Oleg hold on <laughs> this is a button you have to press Ms. Governor, can, can we have less compliance managers, please? Okay, another question to Nikolai. Okay, the big secret, right? You you based legally in the UK, but you're not, from the legal standpoint, a bank. You're a platform. So all these costs have been loaded onto onto the partner bank that you have. So you want to enter the Russian market as a partner of a bank and all the load in terms of operational costs and QIC will be taken by the bank. So you in a way hiding those costs. And you will have a back office but it will be outsourced or given to your partner. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I think you can compare that to and the period of Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, we, we made things with hands, then we had machines, then we had the conveyor belt and factories, and this has allowed to get rid of most jobs. And uh, what we do is, is automation. We have designers, programmers, product owners, and some legal and compliance people which we cannot automate. But you can devise a formula based on legislation, set a number of target parameters, and, and you can compete based on this automation. This is what happened in the trading world. Now you have robots rather than traders, and robots outperform the traders. The same will happen in the banking sphere. So it, it's about how much automation you have. Interesting. I think my colleagues here can disagree with you, because uh, many banks in Russia have a very strong performance the procedures we've been discussing here, they are already automated at a, at a large extent. There is still room to develop. What I want to see is to have you enter the Russian market in a compliant fashion and then take a banking license and demonstrate how you can automate so that you are a benchmark to the market. This would be an awesome example if that will drive the rest of the banking world. 
I would have I would start with top management automation of course we will shall consider that so do you see the future as a non-human business not not having excessive amount of of management yeah i think that that could make sense nikolai do you know the population of europe 650 million people and you have how many active users three million so what market share do you have well in three years, we, we have managed to uh, get half a percent of all the population. What Oleg has described, that the difference between Europe and Russia in terms of bank market development, Europe is about 10 years behind. So your know-how has allowed you to get half the percentage of percent of European population over three years. So I think given the market size and the legal differences and the stage differences in terms of uh, development. So when you have a success story as uh, Tinkoff, as Pochta Bank and so on, that grew up to 10% uh, in the Russian market, then we, we can compare. Okay, well, let, let us try. Well, if investors are ready to give you a lot of money, why not to try? Well, dear colleagues in Russia, any company is allowed to come to the Russian market within the current legislation. If they're successful, we would be competing next year. How to compete with them? Why not? Yeah, especially if they automatize top management. Well, I'd like to remind Nikolai and other startups who are represented here that sooner or later investors would ask you anyway, where is our money, where is our investment, and that would be the very special hour for you. They can give you trillions, but in a certain moment in time they would ask to give you their money back. And if there is no business model, and there is no business model in a certain case, let's say this year we've done 20, 225 billion rubles of net profit, but we can subsidize 30 different currencies, it's, it's nothing to us because we have enough money. But how can you make a business where you are losing, 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 and losing money and losing the money of your investors for years, it's not very clear. Now, I think it's very dangerous. Well, I think Nikolai, in any case, should try because we can only judge based on the result we see and it would be very hard to make judgments even the, when the company is not even on the market. And I suggest you just have a look and see how successful the launch on the Russian market would be. We're welcoming all the players that can bring new high quality to the customer, be that services or products, and the more such players we have, the better for financial system. And now I have a question to the Senior Vice President of Ant Financial Services Group, Mr. Uh, Lee Min Chan. Vladimir just asked us what is the current population of Europe. We know the population of Russia. Those are millions of people. China is more than 1 billion. India is more than 1 billion residents. Alipay company, that is one of the structural departments of Ant Financial, is already servicing around 800 million customers. My question to you is the following. How did you manage in such a short period of time to get so much success? It's not just the number of residents in the country and the population of the country. It's a service that you have offered very quickly and that even to manage to compete successfully against Union Pay payment system. And now Union Alipay is number one from the viewpoint of payments in China. So what are your plans for the future? How do you plan to increase your competitive advantages in the future? If you may, could you please briefly share with us? Because how Alipay is developing is an example of a very successful company that is thinking every day what else they have to bring new in their activities. Thank you, Olga. Uh, thank you for uh, the question and uh, for including me in this panel. Um, Alipay obviously um, was uh, established in 2004 as part of the Alibaba, um, Alibaba's e-commerce uh, platform uh, to address one issue. That issue was trust. 
uh, when uh, China did not have a uh, credit card uh, payment system uh, and uh, uh, the, the buyers on the e-commerce platform uh, was worried uh, that uh, if they paid for merchandise they purchased on platform, uh, how would they, uh, whether they could get the, the merchandise they, they purchased. And the merchants obviously was worried about the delivery of uh, uh, goods without getting paid. So Alipay was established as an escrow account to address that trust issue. And over the years, um, you know, that trust issue, the, the, the mission of providing uh, users with a trusted service has been uh, at the core of our, um, our services. And I think uh, uh, what we have been doing really is to address the customer's pain points. Uh, now clearly, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Alec mentioned, um, you know, as a startup, you need uh, to make money. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, what, what we have been doing is not necessarily looking at a financial returns as a goal, um, and that we look at a sort of how to address um, customers' pain points and what value we bring to the customers. Uh, and I think the uh, three pillow, pillars of uh, uh, and financial success so far really are three things. Uh, one is uh, the uh, regulatory framework. Um, over the years, uh, China, Chinese uh, regulators have been you know, encouraging tech, technology innovations uh, and provided uh, the, uh, with, uh, with uh, the uh, friendly environment in which we have been developing. Uh, number two is the technology innovations, and uh, that enabled us to deliver financial services at a cost-effective manner and a safe manner. And the third one really is the consumer protection. Uh, anything sort of that we uh, deal with from a customer's perspective, uh, the trust is at the core. Uh, so whether uh, from a data privacy protection, uh, from a you know, consumer experience perspective, uh, we work very hard on that. And uh, because of the three sort of factors, uh, we have grown from a, a very sort of a small company in 2004 uh, to a, a company that has over 700 million uh, consumers in, uh, in China uh, on the consumer side and also serve uh, over 50 million uh, enterprises, small and micro enterprises. Uh, so our service has evolved from uh, pure payments to uh, other type of financial services uh, from uh, uh, wealth management, uh, consumer loan, uh, insurance, uh, credit rating, uh, et cetera. So that has, uh, you know, uh, expanded in the uh, in the in the in in the uh, com uh, you know in the past few years. Uh, but I think that the, the key really is to uh, to addressing um, consumers' pain points, work with regulators to uh, really define uh, the type of services that we can provide, and and we work with uh, banks. And it sounds like a, you know there 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 is a a um, lot of things that we can potentially help banks to reach the customer base that are un currently underserved by, by, by banks. Uh, for example, in our um, uh, SME loan department, uh, small micro uh, enterprises, uh, we leverage the technology we, we have, the uh, data analytics we have. Uh, we're able to um, you know, serve um, serve um, many millions of uh, merchants with a very effective sort of uh, uh, financial services that, that it would re require, only require them to file application in three minutes and we can advance fund in one second with zero inter uh, human intervention. And uh, the interesting thing is that they're short term and they address their uh, you know, the, uh, merchants' uh, needs uh, and uh, uh, the average outstanding amount is only 1,600 US dollars. Uh, we're able to deliver that kind of services to, uh, to the segment of a population that really needs the basic financial services. Tell us please, 
who is competing with you on the Chinese market? Who is your competitor in regards of the payment services and the services that you talked about? Or are you a monopoly on the market at the moment? Oh, we are not. I think our league may, may disagree. Uh, I think we look at payments um, uh, sort of a, it's a, one's online um, and one's offline. Uh, online, obviously, people look at it sort of a way where we provide payment services for Alibaba's uh, e-commerce platform. Um, and it has, you know, a very large market share, over 50%. Uh, but then you look at the overall payment, uh, you know, commerce, uh, retail um, market, uh, e-commerce is only uh, about 9% of the overall uh, retail market in, in China, and globally probably even smaller. Um, so uh, that, that's still very small, uh, but a big part of uh, the, um, uh, the payment uh, system is still offline. So offline we have a um, lot of competitors, uh, WeChat, UnionPay, um, and uh, you know, traditional banks, credit card companies, and the cash. Uh, so what, what we really wanted to, um, to do really is not necessarily uh, compete with the, any form of payment method or any particular company. Uh, we would like to be able to sort of a deliver value not only to consumers, but also to merchants. Uh, so working with uh, merchants and uh, provide sort of a value-added service in terms of the targeted marketing for merchants uh, and uh, directing customers to uh, the, the, the shopping destinations or entertainment destinations that they desire is something that we, we think we're very good at it using technology and data, uh, AI and data analytics. Uh, so we, we do compete with a lot of players and uh, you know, China is a very big market, and globally, obviously, you know, when you see 1.7 billion people are underserved by traditional financial institutions, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we can do working with the banks. Uh, now, over the past two years, what we have evolved into is really a technology platform where we have, on the one hand, 700 million uh, users, consumers, uh, and on the other hand, we uh, work with uh, merchants, then the third part of the equation really is uh, for, for banks to come to the platform uh, to service the merchants and uh, consumer. We connect them and we provide them with the technological services of, in terms of risk management, uh, targeted uh, marketing, etc. and the banks would be able to reach the segment of the consumers that they're previously not equipped to serve from a cost perspective. So, so this is a, the new development, and, and with that development, actually our user base grow even more quickly over the past two years. We among those three key elements that supported you to grow very quickly, you mentioned the support from the side of the Chinese regulator. What type of support was that? It is very important to understand whether the regulator is willing to develop one or two companies on the market or whether the regulator is willing to develop competition and create equal playground for everybody. In case of your company and the Chinese regulator, how did you discuss this issue and what was the actual support of the regulator that you believe to be most meaningful? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, when I mentioned uh, the um, regulatory support and regulatory framework really is uh, a set of regulation that, that, that is friendly with the fintech companies uh, for them to develop. Um, we, you know, from 2004, uh, when we first started, Alip first started, uh, China did not have a, a license regime for third party payment companies. Uh, until 2011, um, they started to issue um, third party payment licenses. Um, and it's, to date, uh, there are more than 200 uh, licenses for third-party payment companies uh, issued. So clearly, regulators are encouraging 
the development of uh, healthy development of uh, the market and also uh, development of uh, fintech companies at the same time, encouraging competition. Um, and I think for, for, for uh, players like us um, to be able to um, develop uh, is um, dependent upon a health uh, regulated uh, market. Uh, but then once you uh, regulate too much, then a lot of innovative ideas may not be implemented uh, to the extent they, they should, uh, that, that they, they provide uh, services uh, re needed by, uh, by consumers. So to that end, we work very closely with regulators uh, for regulators to understand what we do um, to uh, provide op optimal consumer services at the same time uh, how we use technology to help regulators to identify and address, manage uh, financial service related risks. Uh, so there's a two-way dialogue. Uh, we, um, you know, through that kind of dialogue, then you understand each other's needs. Uh, then, you know, the market can be uh, better regulated and uh, innovative ideas can be encouraged. Just several months ago, we've seen a deal between Alibaba and Alibaba is entering the Russian market in partnership with Russian companies. You were right in saying that Alipay is one of the key partners for Alibaba in promotion of a full-fledged set of packages of products and services. It's not just sales, but also payments and additional products. Are there any plans from the side of Alipay to go to the Russian market together with Alibaba? And if yes, if you do plan to go to the Russian market, do you plan to service Chinese citizens that will be making payments on the territory of Russia from the viewpoint of interaction with Alibaba, or you would like to go as a full-fledged payment system to the Russian market and operate as one of the foreign payment systems? Uh, we, uh, Alipay provides um, payment service for Alibaba, and in Russia, uh, one of the key plat e-commerce platforms is uh, AliExpress. Uh, so we, we process uh, payments for AliExpress as a payment gateway, um, and we work with uh, uh, local banks, uh, credit card companies, um, and uh, to to address uh, the the payment needs uh, for consumers on uh, AliExpress platform. Uh, so to that extent, uh, as Alibaba continues to uh, expand in uh, in the Russian market, uh, we will work with them. Uh, independently, uh, what we have been trying to do is work with local banks to expand offline payment services in terms of merchant acqu acquiring uh, for Alipay China users visiting Russia. Uh, so that has been sort of a, our primary focus uh, over the past year or so, and I expect that to be our fo key focus over the next years uh, to come. Uh, to respond to your question as to whether we would come in as an independent payment uh, service provider, uh, we don't envision that. And I think uh, uh, Russian market is uh, very unique, very different. Uh, we, we would love to sort of work with a, a local partner from a technological perspective to empower them to deliver uh, e-wallet uh, services uh, to the extent uh, that would make sense. But our key focus will be supporting Alibaba's e-commerce platform in Russia and uh, cross-border uh, payment services for Alipay China users. Thank you very much for your contribution. My next question to Dmitry and Oleg. If we fantasize a little bit and we would say, all right, Alipay would enter the Russian market also as an international payment system to the Russian market. Do you think that the Russian banks and Russian payment systems will be able to compete 
with Alipay? And what are the weaknesses and what are the strengths of the Russian payment system compared to Alipay? Well, first of all, we have a lot of respect for our Chinese colleagues. They supply to Alipay and WePay. They are a huge source of inspiration for our company. And yesterday at the panel, I was saying that we carefully watch what we wallet and WeChat are doing that is indeed very imp impressive and inspiring. However, it is also important to understand that both of those systems demonstrate amazing growth to a large degree thanks to certain restraining factors or special conditions. Uh, banks, they are relatively weak. There is no Visa, there is no MasterCard on the market. So they grew based on those factors. Uh, one based on a messenger, the other system based on basically an exclusive platform to the largest e-commerce in the country. So it's not a monopoly, definitely not. However, there are certain factors and restraining factors. So it is a unique platform in a way. And I don't think it is possible to duplicate this success in Russia because in Russia we have strong commercial banks. There is Sparebank, Visa and MasterCard and so on and so forth. And actually I do not see any opportunity for Alipay to exist here as an independent payment system. And WePay and Alipay are already servicing mostly tourist, Chinese tourists coming to Russia and our merchant flows, be that AliExpress or other. And we have partnership with them. Tinkoff is issuing AliExpress card. And right now we are integrating together with AliPay for acquiring business and the same applies to WePay. Certainly, they have their place, their niche on the market, but that is first and foremost for servicing of Russian-Chinese trading and tourist relationship. For the most part, I agree with Oleg. Alipay is welcome. I think their advantages could still play out in Russia, their connection to Alibaba, they're a big operator. From the technological point of view, I don't think there's much novel. We have been doing it in the Russian market for a while already. If, if they bring something new to a new segment, they're welcome. We can cooperate, uh, we can compete. It is all for the customer's benefits. benefit. Thank you. Another Bank of Russia project that has been done together with the market players, the marketplace, and it's different from remote ID, which will be a national level infrastructural solution. The marketplace that we've uh, been working on is just one of the project that will be competing with other alternatives. At the exhibition stands here, you, you could see that there's a lot of fintechs that are creating their own marketplaces. Some specialize, some have a very broad approach, different business strategies. And my question is to Sergei, your marketplace that you do together with the stock exchange, with the national system, with various marketplaces, do you think this will increase competition, this will improve the market situation for the customer and in terms of the product? Remote ID, I think, is indeed a foundation, a key thing for the development of fintech, for creation of marketplace, for direct distribution of new services and all services. Therefore, biometrics, of course, and having a lot of biometrical data for us is a keystone. I cannot emphasize this enough. Bank of Russia is creating a regulatory framework which will allow for aggregators to spring up that will integrate different offers that exist on the market. What we see now is uh, a lot of services between bank and customer which allow the banks to sell their services remotely. And the marketplace is a solution where software that an individual has on uh, their device will give them access 
to more than one bank. So this creates an atmosphere of trust, an environment of trust, where once a customer is more loyal, they will be able to pick and mix between different brands, even though that they have not been in touch with the bank and they haven't developed trust yet, but the trust will be generated through this channel and the customer will be assured uh, that there are no risks and uh, the funds will be insured through the national system. The second thing that we're doing is uh, streamlining this experience, reducing the number of mouse clicks, uh, reducing the number of seconds between the need in a product and the purchase. This, we believe, is a critical success factor. This is what we've already drafted as a new legislation item and which is now discussed at the State Duma and at other national agencies that we believe are stakeholders. So how is this working? There will be a collection of, con of remotely concluded contracts and this will be, this collection uh, will be a reference to both the service provider and the customer. And it will be easy to join the platform at low costs. And uh, for many players, it will become, to start with, an additional channel. And uh, later on, it might become a central channel of income. Because we don't buy our bread from the industrial-sized bakeries. We buy them at stores. And of course, we have unique geography in Moscow and the cities with a million or more inhabitants. There is choice, but this choice is not available as broadly in small settlements. It will increase competition because the customer will have access to more suppliers and the choice is broader. There will be competition in terms of pricing not a bad thing. And thirdly, we will also make the market more sustainable because thanks to more trust, the penetration of financial services will be deeper and more needs will be covered, more financial services will be provided, the market will grow and this is of course good for the financial industry. This will drive the growth for everyone. Therefore, this Pro this project is important for the regulator from many viewpoints. How many marketplaces should there be? We're preparing three different ones. They can be niche ones. They can compete with one another. Competition is always good, so maybe we will see which one performs better, which will provide better customer security. But this creates difficulty because the rules for identification and profiling will have to be updated. Therefore, financial product provider, if it is resold by someone else, by a third party, then they will have to bear the same responsibility as if they were the owner of the product. So this is the legal constraint that we introduced to ensure trust in this channel. I would also like to highlight that we believe that our main goal is to create a strong environment with strong competition. We would also like to have state bonds to be available in this market. Also, it could be a marketplace for deposits. Uh, maybe not just financial services in a while, we can upgrade it later on. Yes, of course, this is our key task to start with a legal base, legal framework for marketplaces, more than one. This has to be technically solid and uh, legally viable so that marketplaces can be created by other 
players in the market. Why do we do it the second marketplace together with the stock exchange? We want it to compete with, with other ones and ensure the saturation of the market with as many services as possible um, for the customer. My next question is to Ilya. I knew Red Ross Bank was active in discussions of how the marketplace should look like. You worked intensely with our pilot. What does this pro project mean for you? As a lot of what we already have available in the Russian market, do you think there will be some obvious value uh, for the Russian customer there? Or won't there be? Well, we have been very active. We did the pilot and we remain on the team for this marketplace. We believe that there are different versions of uh, marketplace on the market. Some players we already saw them invest heavily, and we want to be able uh, to create a marketplace uh, or join another marketplace. So our decision was to be part of this pilot and see how it grows. Of course, the customer will choose the best marketplace eventually. We'll see if, if uh, our pilot becomes the strongest one. But, but what we can see now, that it has sound approach, it has legal support. So there's hope that this product will be a successful one. And the banks, of course, believe that this is another threat, that they might lose uh, some of the deposits and some other business volume. But the future is there, so we shall not fear competition. We shall be part of that development. And it's also important that this is another product that will stimulate competition in this market. We really welcome more competition in the Russian market. Vladimir? Do you think this, this country needs more marketplaces, or are there already enough? Well, actually, I think people call different things marketplace. So this specific project, we now looking at it, we for competition, but we will make a decision based on our business interests, based on the, the project's uh, economic profile. Sergei? rightly noted that we started with biometrics and f fast payment because these are the infrastructural elements that will give the opportunity to market players to develop other new services, new products. And I also think that another common element we've been discussing for a while is the digital profile also has been around for a while at least the discussion about it has been around for a while as with remote ID but I hope that we will be faster in implementing it because I think as of now this need the need for digital ID digital profile has become obvious for to everyone Everybody needs this information at their hand. Therefore, my next question is to everyone on the panel. What do you need from the digital profile service? There are, there are two parts to it. First, the one that will use the data provided by state agencies. And second part, data coming from commercial players. And we will have a comprehensive profile for an individual customer or for a business which will facilitate service provision to many players on the market. The government now is now creating the architecture for this and we really need to help the government so that this is a functional and useful tool. I think I started with that, that digital economy or digital governance is impossible without digital profile. 
for data storage for the state agencies, for commercial use, for digital identification that can provide access to services. It's very important that we do it right, that we don't have too much haste, because the experience with uh, different credit history bureaus that we've had, it has demonstrated that it hasn't always built a smooth road. And this is very simple, actually. But think about digital profiles of uh, people who have been, I don't know, completed with mistakes if somebody and the commercial structure or at the state agency fills them and makes mistakes and we will have digital profiles of, of uh, non-humans rather than people will might look like a camel based on their digital profile so we need to start with reliable digital access and biometrics based access to state services i'd like to reduce time on this i don't i, I don't have any thoughts on that I think that digital profiling and biometrics, if done right, can give new space for growth for, for the national economy for up to 10 years. I agree with Mitri that it has to be done first at the minimum level. The 20% of information will, will give 80% of the result. I don't think there has to be any data from the commercial place there. Don't overload that. Ilya? I think the infrastructure of the digital profile fits very well with the digital strategy that uh, our state has. And this has a direct connection to the other initiatives we discussed that including the the biometrics and I think this is uh, the right choice of uh, direction of development and it's very important to ensure security of, of customer data and I think this this is of course of key importance Nikolai you are not actively taking part in this such infrastructural projects, but when you'll be entering the Russian market, you will have to become familiar with them and I hope start using them. From the point of view of business, a country which has fast payment system and customer data provided uh, by state agency, will this be helpful to you or, or do you need this as a business? In comparison to Europe, the biometrics and, and digitization is only taking first steps in the UK. I, I used it for a couple of times and the system that they have is, is not a convenient one because the UI and UX aren't done very well. Fast payment system in the UK and uh, Europe, SEPA and distant SEPA, I think 99% of payments use that system, so that is a must-have. So I think for our, the national economy, it is a must-have. Thank you. It's good to hear that, that we're doing something that you believe is a must-have, that the market tells us that. I think we should only do jointly things that can benefit everyone and not engage in projects which have questionable results. To conclude, I would like to ask um, bank representatives here on this panel if you need anything to add to the existing infrastructure or these three platforms is enough and if we improve them and perfect them this would be sufficient for successful digitalization in this country. Dmitri, I think that uh, remote ID and fast payments have to be done 
And of course, I'm 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 not a fan of of doing 100 things at a time and trying to run too fast. No, let let's launch one thing at a time. Let's first work with remote ID, then do fast payments. Zero tariffs don't seem to be very sustainable. I don't think the system will work well enough uh, if the tariff is as low. We launch that. We reg find the right tariff, then we launch marketplace. I'm a bit conservative about the marketplace, but let, let's let do it. Why not? There are people who are more optimistic about it. So I would do it in a consecutive fashion, so let's do it. Yes, we're discussing three different projects, at least, and all of them are fairly innovative and costly in, in terms of uh, both funding and uh, workload. So I'd rather also concentrate and do what's necessary because the more projects you have, the more bureaucracy it builds and people will just be talking and so on. Let's just launch these three things and that will be already something. Maybe you can promise us that the next uh, meeting in a year, the three projects will already be implemented and operational. Well, I can promise if you promise i also support a focused approach you know as 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 they taught when we were young pioneers that you have to be, go big if you want to do something so let's go big but focused i will agree with my colleagues these are large scale projects they seem to be working smoothly so far but so let's execute these ones and then see what else needs to be done Thanks to the panelists, thanks uh, to my colleagues, thank you to the audience as well. We now understand what we have to focus on and what we should be discussing at the next Finopolis. We should perhaps gather the same panel in a year to hear how their doubts and hopes have played out. Thanks to everyone. Please stay because we will now have the startup award ceremony so could you please stay for that for about 10 minutes thank you уважаемые участники форума мы начинаем церемонию награждения победителей финала конкурса стартапов The participants were about to start announcement of the fintech startup context and please welcome Anton Arnaut, the CEO of the fintech lab. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, I haven't seen you in a while. Yesterday we've been awarding the strategic team winners and today, according to a nice tradition of the Finopolis, we announced the winners of the finalists of the fintech startup contest and i'm very happy to say that at this fourth finopolis we have already two valleys the first valley is the valley of the winners and the second one is of the ones that used to be startups and now are a big grow quickly growing company so those are not just guys drinking smoothies in the co-working spaces they're actually doing real businesses so please welcome the deputy governor of the central bank of russia olga skargabatova and all Nikolai Steronsky from Revolut Company. Please welcome them on stage. And now we'd like to give the floor to our winner so that very briefly they could represent their startups, do their pitches. Well, we will not replace their name tags, I guess. People know you anyway. So we would invite guys to represent their projects very quickly. And the first project is called Kruta. Cool. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Habarov and I represent a mobile app called Kruta or Cool. Our mobile app enables uh, enterprises, banking, banks and insurance companies to motivate the customers to buy their products, their offers and their services. 
So far, we operate in the FMCG sector. We have 1 million users. Around 3 million bills are being processed on a monthly basis. For banks and insurance, we can be useful because we bring them extra traffic uh, customers and we would support them in analyzing borrower applications and update information and analyze information on the bill from each transaction done via bank card. That's it. Very briefly, thank you very much for choosing us as a winner. We would be very happy to cooperate with you and be very happy to meet you at the Startup Alley and we'll be happy to represent our offer. Congratulations. Well, unfortunately, we had to split the third place because it was a very tough fight. So it is one of the winners of the third place in our contest. Thank you. And now please welcome the second winner who got the third place, that is Croft Talk Project. Um, they will deliver a very brief presentation. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Dennis Peterhoff. I represent Croft Talk Project and our platform. This is an automated platform for customer communication using AI bots. We do not just automize the service, we also automize sales, customer support and marketing. We um, analyze this data and manage customer experience. Our platform is already used by a number of big well-known projects and apart from that, we proceed from the key idea that if you want to have access to the heart of your customer, you have to be in his smartphone. That was it. If you'd like to learn more, please come and talk to us at the Startups Alley. Thank you. You fully covered Mr. Steronsky with your back. All right. Congratulations on the victory. From a big startup to a small startup, it would be a very tough pay for you guys. Hard not just with the Russian banks, but also with Russian startups. So be prepared to, to be very patient. All right, and the next project that got the second place in our competition. And I'm happy to say that it's not just a great project, that's a Sinaka project, but it's also a very meaningful project and you'll get a, a nice grant as a winner. Trust me. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to thank you for the high assessment of our project. Our platform is doing an exchange of account uh, of invoices between legal entities in an electronic form, and that enables you to immediately pay for it from your current account by sending payments to your bank. Thank you. So that's a fast payment for legal entities. So indeed, a very interesting solution. And a very promising development, I would say. Based on this platform, you can do a lot of different things. We congratulate you with a victory. I think that's indeed a great solution for the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please welcome our winner startup that got the first place, that's Q Platform. Thank you. We're extremely happy to receive this award. Our project is an open financial API and development of electronic interaction in the market. That is a two-way platform that brings together fintech and banking infrastructure, where a bank can use it like an app store and get an app, be that a front office or a placement of the part of the internal processes. And our company represent guys from technical consulting, banking and IT security. Yesterday I explained how it can be done by a bank. We are happy to grow further according to a multi-banking model and we're going to create a community around us and we'd be happy to see as part of this community the market is developing and we're very happy to see a dialogue going on. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It is a very important solution for us. We are about to make our choices as for the frameworks and standards of open interfaces. Our colleagues have made the first step there and will definitely continue this conversation. I'm sure it will be very important for the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
thank you for paying this attention to our startups. That's uh, like an advance payment for you. Well, they got the advance payment at the previous Finopoly, so we're waiting for the results from that. Many thanks to everybody and congratulations on the victory on your victory. Уважаемые участники форума Финополис, объявляется кофе-брейк. Dear guests, there will now be a short...